Um, we hope you get a ton out of today's conversation and you're reminded why um, places such as the Bob Marsh Wilderness are such a wonderful place. Um, I'm Erin Castellanos, the Education and Partnership Specialist with the Foundation. Uh, the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation has worked for the past 26 years to connect people with wild places. We partner with the Forest Service to maintain all the work that goes into caring for space, the space, which encompasses 1.6 million acres. Uh, this year, we have more volunteer opportunities than ever before. Uh, they are ranging for any type of physical ability. If you're wanting to get out into the Bob, and want to learn more about that, um, you can visit our website at www.bmwf.org, or you can chat with Allison and Angela, who are just outside at the table, if you have any questions about some of our trips this summer. We'd also like to thank our partners that have helped us put on this event, including Wild Montana, um, the Flathead Community Center, Northwest Montana Lookout Association, and the Natural Resource Conservation Management Program at Flathead Valley Community. And can we give them all a round of applause, please? <laughs> and as a reminder, we would not have places like the Bob to exist here as they are today without the people who have cared for it and stewarded for the land long before it was called the Bob. The Bob sits on the traditional homelands of the Blackfoot as well as the Salish, and we are lucky enough to have the members of the Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribe here, and we would like to thank them for trusting us with their knowledge about a place that means so much to us all. And a little bit about your speaker tonight. Uh, Kim is the department head of the Cultural and Language Studies um, and an Indigenous STEM instructor for the Salish Kootenai College Native American Studies Division. He lends experiential learning on subjects of culture and science Previous to this position, Kim spent eight years as a business partner and field supervisor for the archaeological firm called Ethnotech. And he also served as a supervisor of archaeological field survey for the Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribe Historic Preservation Department. Kim's experience with his elders' teachings and his decades-long study of traditional ecological knowledge, ethnobotany, and indigenous studies, or science also, um, combined with his extensive experience in field archaeology. He brings a unique quality and perspective to his teaching and outdoor experiential opportunities. He works passionately to connect the tribe back to their land. This includes facilitating a Mission Mountain Youth Crew in 2023. Before I bring him up, I also want to thank you all uh, for being here and for showing us that you care about expanding your understanding about our wild places. So, no, no more of an introduction. Here's Tim. <laughs> <clears throat> Just uh, testing, testing. Does that sound, everything okay, Tim? Okay. Yeah, I better check that first off. Testing, there we go. <laughs> Technology. Um, first off, I feel a little too tall there <laughs> for my size. Chastal tal fesia. That's a good day, everybody, in the Salish Pondere language. Um, my name is Tim Ryan. As Aaron said, um, I do have a Salish name, and that Salish name is Swene, and that means Sasquatch or Bigfoot, <laughs> which is <laughs> kind of appropriate for um, the size of my feet and my height. Um, uh, I hold that uh, name dear to me because that was given to me by a, an elder woman, Frances Vandenberg, who I helped to horse pack into the Bob Marshall Wilderness, and we recorded all the camps and trails and stories and place names back in there. So you'll, you'll see a photo of her coming up too. So, um, wonderful. Uh, I see a lot, or well, not a lot, a few faces out there that I recognize. Oh, there's Bonnie. Yeah, good. <laughs> And um, it's good. I, a lot of friends kind of put it out on Facebook, and I was a little overwhelmed by the response of people asking me if they're, they're going to stream this live. And I said, no, but it'll be recorded for later viewing and such, so they'll get a chance to um, know what I do. 
which is kind of a mystery because I do so many things and I think I got to shorten up that bio a little bit. It seems a little lengthy there. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry about that. But um, I realize um, I'm in my 60s now and um, you go through a lot in your life and this is kind of where I'm at now. And um, I appreciate your interest in uh, hearing me and talking about the tribes, our tribes of Montana, especially the Intermountain tribes, Salish, Kootenai, Pend Oreille, and um, their their movements on the landscape and their uh, use traditional uses of these landscapes too. Um, uh, in the culture and language program that we have at the Salish Kootenai College, it's the first time ever, I believe, that any college or university has actually um, produced a bachelor's in science in Salish culture and language. Um, and that was moved to the college in the academic realm uh, because, uh, well, uh, it was started, uh, Tony Cashola, who was the president of the culture committee, he has passed away now, but it was his wish to bring it into the academic world where they can start um, creating more capacity to teach um, the culture and the language and to produce uh, culturally knowledgeable individuals and future elders of the Salish Pondere and the Kootenai people. So, great. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And I'm honored to be here, too, because I look at the list of all the speakers that have been on here. It's like, wow, that's, that's pretty impressive. So um, uh, thank you for inviting me here. I um, want to kind of start out with this graphic here. It's a graphic that I created uh, from the information from the culture committees, specifically the Pondere and the Salish culture committees. And um, of course, this was never a printed graphic or, or like a calendar that we have nowadays. This was embodied in the consciousness of the indigenous peoples um, and their seasonal round. And as you see here, we got four seasons and then we have the um, Roman calendar on the outside. And then the inner ring from that is the Salish um, identification of those months corresponding. And uh, right now we are in the month of April, which is the buttercup month, and the buttercups are up. And along with other first roots that were uh, my students and I are surveying at this time, and we'll be another week or two, we'll be setting up a camp to do our uh, first roots camp, and we'll be harvesting bitterroot, uh, biscuit roots, um, and, and things like that. So uh, we, through my schooling, we set up uh, uh, four um, seasonal encampments and the students participate. We have some of the other reservation schools that participate and some of the public also participates in these traditional camps. Um, <clears throat> okay, so one thing that this is, I think this is one of the things that really helps people to understand um, indigenous peoples. Uh, when I look at this, I see a calendar and I see a map. There's a time and place for all these activities to happen. And um, most ind indigenous peoples, your ancestors, my ancestors followed a seasonal round. We still follow a seasonal round today, right? We don't go skiing in the summer unless we're really rich and we go to the Swiss Alps or something like that, right? <laughs> but um, in general, we, we have similar, in some ways, similar um, seasonal rounds. And they're very, they can be very specific to an individual very specific to an individual in a place. So, um, and then, then within the inner rings of that uh, Salish round, then we have uh, our travel. All of Western Montana is comprised of mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. And you wouldn't want to winter in the mountains, you winter in the valleys. The valley bottoms where most of the resources are, and you can tolerate the snow and things like that during winter. So we have the spring, summer, and fall where you're basically preparing, gathering all your foods and um, construction materials, uh, doing all of your interaction with other tribes and other people, <clears throat> trade, ceremony goes on and it's all built up to, to uh, live through the winter, uh, to get yourself set for the winter <clears throat> with uh, foods and such and other medicines and teas and things like that. Uh, the other ring inside there is big game, deer, fowl, elk, bison, and such. And then the, the inner ring to that is the fish. Um, 
the, the buttercup month, I was wondering, I asked an elder, well, what was the, what's the big issue, or what, what is the big importance about the buttercup? Um, I don't know of any really medicinal parts of it. It's not a main food. But what it is, it's a cultural bioindicator that spring is coming and to get your, uh, that better days are coming. It's also a cultural bioindicator of the cutthroat preparing to spawn. And so then when the buttercup comes up, that it's a sig signaling to my ancestors and even us today, um, modern indigenous peoples, that we should get our fishing gear ready and be ready and observe the streams and be um, watching for the, uh, the cutthroat to be coming up in the smaller feeder, feeder streams and laying their eggs and such and reproducing themselves. Um, on, on the other end, in the fall, we have uh, the bull trout that will spawn in the fall and the cultural bioindicator for that is the larch trees. When the larch trees start turning yellow, then it's a sign that uh, we should start look, watching the streams and get our fishing gear ready because uh, incorporating on those major um, uh, vents for spawning is really important um, for the livelihood uh, of our tribes. Um, so, of course, we have environmental indicators too that, that uh, indicate certain trends in the environment to scientists. But when we look at uh, 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 human beings, then I, we tend to call that cultural bio indicators, and I'll be um, talking about that too. So it's it's so right now, I'm watching the service berry that's next to my home, and once that blooms, then that means on the other side of the reservation, on the west side of the reservation, the bitterroot are are have emerged and they're ready to be dug. So I mean, it's it's, it's a wonderful way to be able to identify your next move, what, what needs to happen by nature. Because these plants are stimulated by heat, light, water, and other factors, but that's probably a better um, indication of a time to do something than it would be putting it on the calendar and say, well, we're gonna dig bitterroot at this time. You go out there and it's not ready, right? And there's just a short little window for bitterroot to be dug too, because you, you don't, we don't dig it when it has the flower, we dig it when it has the more uh, succulent type of growth to it that it comes up with, and that's the time where you can where you can take the sheath off the root and such. So there's a short window, week a week, maybe even two weeks for you to harvest that. So it's important that you you incorporate on those uh, those things. Okay, so um, time and place, a map. There's trails that lead to all these resources cultural resources and such oh something like that okay so just a, a little bit about me um working in the tribal historic preservation office for the tribes um i helped to map three sections of the lewis and clark route through montana i believe it's the bitterroot national forest lolo national forest and the helena helena national forest and um just to a little bit of perspective on our tribes and the elders, when I presented this image to them and they, and they saw the, uh, the, Lewis, the Lewis and Clark Trail, they, they commented and said, well, Lewis and Clark didn't create those trails. Why are they naming it after them? You know? And so I always reinforce that by saying, well, it was a route that they took. And I got kind of... Um, high on my horse with the presentation. I said, yeah, those were our, 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 our Indian trails, right? That was our, because the elders were in front of me. I said, yeah, those were our trails, right? And, and then Mike Durgle, senior, a Ponderé elder, he spoke up, he said, oh no, no, those aren't, those aren't our trails either. He said, those are the animal trails. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so that's kind of more the perspective of an indigenous person looking at the landscape that way. So, uh, of course, I was, um, that device that I'm wearing right there in the year of 2000, 23 years ago, uh, we were getting ready for the uh, Lewis and Clark Bicentennial, and that was coming up in 2006. And so we had to inventory uh, all the, the uh, artifacts and features, cultural resources associated with the uh, trail. Um, that Lewis and Clark and the Corps of Discovery was using um, on their journey across Montana. Uh, that's a GPS unit there that costs about 
$15,000 in that day. If you have some of you nodding your head, you're familiar with the Pro XRX, uh, or XRS, yeah, and uh, now our phones can do just as well as that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting how technologies advance that way. And that uh, antenna was always hanging up on trees and things like that, so it was, it was a pain in the butt. Um, but uh, I've, I've embarked on a lot of heritage education for park systems, for um, schools, universities, um, colleges, um, civic organizations. Uh, there I'm with the Two Eagle River School, an alternative school for the, on the Flathead Reservation, and we gathered materials to make a fish trap. Um, I also make museum quality items that uh, have uh, material culture, re represents the material culture of our tribes and uh, uh, museums a contract with me to put them in their museums and represent the tribe's um, uh, technologies and material culture. Um, yeah. Talking about digging sticks up here. Okay, so as I said, time and place. This is kind of nice to overlay this graphic right here where, whoops, where uh, this old historic image here, some of you may have seen that, that's uh, Missoula Valley there. University of Montana's right, sitting right there. <laughs> the uh, Hellgate Canyon, and then the Rattlesnake Creek comes in that way. That area there is why, is why uh, Missoula is called Insla Eye, which means place of bull trout in the Salish uh, place name there. And um, I like that photo. It looks, it appears to me to be uh, early spring, so they're probably digging bitterroot. Salish family digging bitterroot in the Missoula Valley. Missoula Valley was noted for its bitterroot uh, resources there. And of course, Hellgate Canyon, associated with trails. In studying historic maps and such, um, there's a series of Hellgates all through the Rocky Mountain area. And the old maps, they, they identified Hellgates here and there. And then this, this canyon here is what, uh, that Hellgate name uh, remained with it. Um, and it, as with my trail work, um, we've usually found that there's alternate routes around these Hellgates so that uh, you don't uh, always have to go through there and, and chance being ambushed um, by your enemy. And so the alternate route here is one is Patty Canyon, which is on the other side of Mount Sentinel there. And then on the on the other the northern end, you have the Mount Jumbo Saddle. Like you, you you travel up the Rattlesnake, you go over the saddle, and then you're out um, going uh, east from there. And uh, I believe David Thompson, when when he came through, he used that saddle. He actually did. He he hiked up the top of Mount Jumbo also, and that was just shortly after Lewis and Clark came through. Uh, David Thompson came through about 2007 or so uh, in this area. So they they were pretty close in their um, and their travels and such as, as with Lewis and Clark. Um, so the Hellgate Treaty, our tribes reserve the right to hunt and fish and gather in our custom areas in our Aboriginal territories, our homelands. And that is based on that seasonal round um, of our movements on the landscape and um, the resources that we incorporated on within those landscapes, the cultural resources, um, that's why we reserved those rights because we were still uh, moving in a subsistence lifestyle to these different areas where these resources are. Um, even during even during homesteading and such, there was uh, still they were going back to some of the lands that were homesteaded and camping on them. Sometimes those homesteaders were were, were friendly enough to keep them. Um, a, let them keep on uh, camping and and um, using their grounds for uh, berry gathering um, and such. Their trails went right through a lot of these uh, early homesteads too, and so they they were still um, needing those trails to get to these cultural resources. Um, Louis, another of mine, Louis Adams. Let's go back to this one more time. He. Um, he was given a presentation, I think it was a smaller town and in, the, in, in eastern Montana. And uh, an old guy said, well, 
you know, my family's been here for generations upon generations. My grand, my great grand grandfather said, we never did see you people moving through here. So were you guys here? What, what was going on? And Louis said, well, we were, we didn't want you to see us coming through here. So we, we took the alternate routes. <laughs> and we, we took the routes that you didn't know about. Um, and that, that's embodied with, uh, well, let's skip to this, this main, this, this here, the, net, the trail network of the Salish Kootenai tribes. Of course, these are the main routes. They're the highways and such. And if I was to put the secondary and the tertiary uh, trails, it would just be a spider web up there on that scale, of course. Um, so there was alternate routes that uh, our elders were talking about trying to avoid conflict with either non-tribal people or other um, uh, tribes uh, that were uh, moving into our territory or that we had historic um, um, enemies and such like that. So uh, those secondary trails got used quite a bit. Um, okay. So this is a quote by Tony Ikashola. He basically said, before the horse and the incursion of the Plains tribes into our territories, we had, a, we had bands of our people all through these mountains from the Buffalo of the Missouri, Muscle Shell, and Yellowstone rivers to the east and to the west. We had the salmon beyond the Bitterroot Mountains. Then you go from the Sweetgrass Hills down to the Yellowstone country, and, your, and our people were there too. And that's a quote by T Tony Cachola, uh, Pondere Elder. And um, working in with with the elders to identify some of these major trail routes was Mike Durgo Sr. Um, and you'll be seeing a photo of him. He was he was a Ponderay elder. He was also a cartographer, and he helped to survey the last survey of the of the reservation boundaries and such. And so, uh, very talented man and, and very uh, uh, a major cultural informant that I worked with quite a bit. Him and I, we consulted on this map, and we put together this, this, this generalized uh, map trail system that encompasses Montana, Idaho, Washington, Wyoming, and Canada as part of our larger area. And you could almost kind of consider that as our homelands or Aboriginal territory. The, uh, as you see the lines, there's still an arrow that's going out because even through historic documents and some of the uh, recorded um, recordings of our elders, they're still identifying places that are out there. And so then we don't want to say, we don't want to put an end point to that when we still know that there's more information coming out, even archaeological information to a certain degree can be associated with our tribes or such. Um, so this is kind of an interesting perspective too, because no boundaries there, you know, and that's uh, in, in, in Sage Kootenai and Pondre didn't see those boundaries. Okay, um, I gotta stay on track here too. Sometimes I get <laughs> off track a little bit and I gotta watch my time. So, um, okay, so Aboriginal Trail, trail Network, um, you can almost imagine these, the, the, the thousands, millions of acres that were ceded to the federal government during the, um, um, the Hellgate, of, Hellgate Treaty of 1855 and where our reservation is now. Um, I've traveled quite a few of these major trail routes here and some of the alternate routes. Um, at a very early age, I was backpacking, camping and such by myself at times and being out in the woods. And so much like 11, 12 years old, my grandmother from St. Ignatius, I, I grew up in my early days in Missoula, up, up the rattlesnake, as a matter of fact, and the Mount Jumbo was my with my backyard and the Rattlesnake Creek was my front yard. And so I spent a lot of time outdoors and uh, my grandmother, she said, grandson, come here, I wanna, I wanna talk to you. And um, she said, you, you spent a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, you spent a lot of time out in the woods. I see that. She said, I, wanna, I want to share something with you. I want you to be very aware of everything out there. I want you to be very conscious of the things something comes to start talking to you, you be very brave and you listen to what they have to say to you. And I'm going, wow, uh-oh. 
um, basically she was telling me this is the way you can get your sumesh or your personal medicine which is somewhat like a vision quest that's basically what vision quest is it gets you you, you, you're, you're in a state where you can communicate with the spirit world and they gift you with certain abilities and medicine to help yourself and your family, and maybe even the tribe. And so um, after th she said that, I was like a little wary of going in the woods, but that still didn't stop me, of course, but I was actually, I was more inspired to, to go out in the woods to find that spiritual uh, connection and that, that, that intimate tie with the landscape around me. So that early um, exposure to the wildlands and natural areas, um, so, uh, I made my connection, still making my connection, so much that um, in Boy Scouts, I was always the kid finding the cool stuff, like antlers and fossils and feathers and crystals and things like that. So other, other ones were following me around trying to find that stuff too. So <laughs> I, I lend that to um, my early exposure to these wild, wild and natural areas. And, uh, and so most of my work these days is in that realm of, of helping people to connect with that landscape around them, um, especially our tri tribal membership, which is part of their culture, which is uh, to have a full, um, fully embracing your culture is also embracing the natural world around you and such because all the cultural resources you need to make um, your culture, um, to preserve your culture, protect your culture, and perpetuate your culture, especially indigenous peoples. And, you know, I, I want to be more inclusive than exclusive. In my classes, I have 50% are tribal members, 25% tribal members from other places from the United States, and then a 25% who are not tribal members or who are not of tribal indigenous affiliation. Um, but I always say that we all have a shared heritage because we all come from ancestors who were indigenous or who were uh, had that close intimate tie to the to the land around them. They had to because you're here today. If they didn't, then you wouldn't be here today. So in some ways, in the indigenous worldview, the reciprocation of that that respect and that acknowledgement of the wildlands is important. And I think that most everyone should have that sense of honoring our landscapes, our natural and wild areas, because we're here today because of them. Proper functioning and diverse ecosystems are key um, to our livelihood. I mean, we're here today because of that, because of our, our ancestors. So that's our shared heritage. So I want you to feel in a way that you are also can embody this information, embody that philosophy, uh, uh, that indigenous worldview. Um, when I work with my students and I compare and contrast Western and indigenous worldviews, at the end of the day, I ask them, well, what, what worldviews do, do you want to adhere to? What, which ones, and they usually say the indigenous worldview, um, community, uh, holistic uh, approaches to things. Um, um, the health of yourself, your family, your community. I mean, all these things are fairly universal with all people for sure. Um, but the, I think the key thing, especially with, I think with most of you are advocates of wildlands and, and natural areas, is that inanimate objects in the, in the indigenous worldview, inanimate objects are alive. That rock is alive, the rain, um, insects, of course, trees and animals and such. And so if those resources are alive, and they have a consciousness, they have families, then there's a higher respect for them. And that uh, a higher respect in, re in realizing that you, we are dependent on those things too. So nowadays we may not be so dependent on, you know, food wise and such, but what about spiritually? What about how we feel when we're in these places? Um, I've, I've taken some courses in uh, Leave No Child Left Inside, which uh, John Young was one of the, one of the individuals. And um, it's pretty amazing some of the, the workshops I was involved with, especially with even autistic kids and how they change when they're outdoors and such, when they're in, in that environment and such. Um, of course, they've done a lot of studies about uh, people who live 
around natural areas and who are immersed with plants around them, their, their well-being and their health is better than people who aren't, who, are, who live in the concrete jungles and asphalt jungles and things like that. So uh, that's something we need to really think about in our advocacy for wild lands and natural areas and how, how it helps us heal. Okay, so uh, let me see. I might bounce around here with these slides a little bit. Um, of course, uh, talking about Aboriginal territories and the resources, um, my ancestors had to deal with a lot of different in ecosystems, the plants, their maturity, uh, where to get certain resources and such. And so then this, this is basically a place names map that the, uh, the culture committee has put together identifying certain um, uh, place names. And those place names can be really um, uh, descriptive of some of those cultural resources uh, there. Okay, so this is basically a season around uh, example. Now, we, if we look at homesteaders, they were expected to raise all their food on 160 acres or something similar to that and to farm their land, their, their plants and animals to be sufficient on that 160 acres. Well, our, our, re, our cultural resources and foods are spread out throughout a large area. And so you would be, of course, like take Missoula, wintering ground, Missoula Valley. Uh, the buttercup comes up. We start getting our, our uh, fishing gear together for the cutthroat. Pretty soon the bitter, bitterroot's up in the valley there. We're harvesting the bitterroot. And then eventually, early um, summer, midsummer, the wild rose blooms, which is another cultural bioindicator that on the Rocky Mountain front, the bison cows have dropped their calves. And by the time we travel in a large encompassing loop out to the Rocky Mountain front to hunt the bison, the calves are going to be well enough on their own that we can hunt the cows because the cows were more efficient. The meat was, it wasn't as tough. The hides were easier to process. And so we were looking at, so the wild rose as a cultural bioindicator, what was happening on the Rocky Mountain front from all the way on the, on, on the western part of Montana. So that, that's pretty amazing. Um, so this is an example of, you can see here, most of the, we got some of the main camps and this is, this is uh, backed up by archaeology too. Some of the, my archaeological experiences are with this source. And then of course you got lithic or stone tool quarries that are spread out through Western Montana that have emerged through a lot of the te plate tectonics and the, and the, uh, the emergence of the uh, Rocky Mountain range, which then exposed a lot of the bedrock and exposed uh, especially uh, the Madison limestone formation, which is, uh, which is part of the development of chert material. Chert is a, is a siliceous or a, a silica-based material to make arrowheads, projectiles, scrapers, and things like that. And, um, and the closest place that our tribes got obsidian was down in Yellowstone, right about right in that area there. And so most of these other sources, actually that's obsidian there too, but most of the other sources of, of quarries would be chert material. Um, that with that a lot of our um, and one main chert material would be uh, this right there south of Drummond which is called the eyebrow chert and that's central to a lot of the homelands of the Salish Kootenai and the Ponderay. Um, okay so that's that's a season around after the horse came before the horse when we were walking which I think it was, I kind of say that's the true essence of our tribes when we pre-horse, like any technology changes um, the way we do things. The, in the days of pre-horse, those seasonal rounds were probably shorter, small, smaller encompassing loops. And we may not have been getting out into the Rocky Mountain front as much, but till after the horse it came. And that's a general um, uh, phenomenon with most all tribes. 
that after the horse came, their ranges were, were, became long, uh, bigger and also uh, more um, <clears throat> conflict with other tribes had, had started that way too. Okay. So the elders talked about too is that uh, from what they recall from the old stories, uh, some of the old stories that they were really looking forward to the spring and getting out on the landscape. I did something here and that's not advancing. Let's see. Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so um, a lot of my knowledge comes from elders, interacting with the elders, uh, some of my own um, archaeological work through the years, um, other tribe, tribal people, uh, research, and things like that. And uh, there's Francis Vandenberg there, who I helped a, a horse pack in the Bob Marshall, and then Louis Adams up there. Louis Adams, we're, we're next to, we're down by the um, Big Hole River, an area called Fish Trap. And so I'm wondering, how did that name Fish Trap get to that, that place they've got there? So uh, all I can figure is that the early settlers of that area were observing um, our tribes using fish traps in that area. And when I look at the river, it's right behind us in that parking lot. When I go over that river there, it's wider, shallower, and it's got uh, certain amenities that will help for, for putting a, a willow fish trap in there and fishing that way. I believe through the, uh, through the archaeological record, <clears throat> um, willow fish traps don't last, of course, through the record. And I do believe that we were, um, the Pond Array were kind of considered more um, water people or fish, fishing people. And um, it is with that culture, it was, is one reason why we won um, our water rights in Montana here, um, such as just exhibiting our dependency on the waterways. Um, because if we were, big game was short, we were always, we always could count on fishing. We could, when we were fishing, every camp we were at, we were always putting fish traps out and we we're continually fishing. Um, old men, young boys that didn't go out on the hunt, they were always fishing too. So that was a main um, cultural activity. And then here's Mike Durgle Sr., um, who I worked with quite a bit. And he, he started making a series of maps. Um, whoops. Like, you know, I used, to, I used to work in my early age with the first PCs and the first Macs, and I always thought I was pretty good technolo te with technology, but I messed, okay, stay. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, my, Mike was a lot of fun to work with. He's he, a uh, he, very culturally knowledgeable person, and here we're with the, at a culturally scarred tree down in the Bitterroot. Um, he started taking a lot of the archaeological uh, reports and the elders' stories and, and place names, and he was putting them together on maps. He, he created this map here of the Bitterroot Valley with the uh, Salish place names there. And, um, and so then now he, he took a lot of the uh, uh, other topographic uh, uh, maps and he started to plot them out. So we've got uh, a stacks of maps that he, he's did his own cartography with and identifying these cultural sites, um, bringing together the, the elders information, cultural information and archeological information too. So it's kind of, it's pretty comprehensive in that way. And um, he had a way of, of uh, reading the landscape through topographical maps and, and identifying where those trails most likely would be or with archeological evidence, they would be there. And, and I was, we drove some of those trails with, with Mike and he would identify most likely where those trails would go. And then we would ground truth that and actually go out there and see where the trail tread is and such. So yeah, wonderful guy. Did some wonderful work with him on identifying trails. And with that work, what did we do? We, this is, we put it into a GIS system. The layers, a GIS system, we put in oral histories, place names, trails, archaeological sites, plants, foods, construction materials. And I used to be really hot in the GIS realm, but, um, and that was during the command line, if any of you are, know about the GIS software. Arc yeah, Arc Info, right, there you go. Now, um, I leave that up to the younger individuals and such. They, they can 
run circles around me on that. <laughs> um, and so what, what do we get out of this map? This is an example of, of, of one of those maps. Uh, we would have polygons, lines, points that would uh, identify uh, certain cultural resources. Um, like here, we've got a bitterroot ground there. We've got trails coming through here. We identify a culturally modified tree along the trail. Um, some of the old stories, working with the elders out in the field. This is um, um, uh, Joe Kaluuya, working with him, very, very um, important elder too. And most of these elders are gone now too. So um, it's uh, that valuable information um, was passed on to me and other individuals. And now um, I'm passing it on to my students and you guys. Um, okay. So when we, when we picture Salish Kootenai Pondere people, how do we picture them in our mind? When we, when we think about the Hopi or the Navajo, we, we see them um, in, the, in, in their structures, their, their hogans and such, and, and um, typically who they are. We, we can see that image. The Inuit, we can see the image of them uh, on the tundra and their marine life and hunting and such. But how do we envision our intermountain tribes, say the scrutiny and Pondere? And this is a Curtis photo that I think that represents um, our tribes and, and where they have it, where, part of the landscapes they inhabited. Of course, next to rivers, the Flathead River is right in front here. Uh, the Mission Mountains is back there. And we're camped under these wonderful ponderosa pines, old growth ponderosa pines. And, um, and this would have been a typical uh, camping scene, um, wintering scene here of the Salish. Here's the same image, but it was um, a sketch by F.N. Wilson during the 30s too, and it just kind of shows a little bit more graphically um, that scene there. Okay, so cultural landscape, indigenous science, ecological knowledge, the elders or the, the, uh, the ancestors knew that uh, they could manage their cultural resources on the land by the use of fire. And so they produced uh, the old growth forest that we see today. I'm, I'm going to kind of go out on the limb a bit that all old growth forest is a product of our indigenous tribes in Western Montana. The, the annual, if not annual, or regular burning events created a parkland. And even a lot of the early settlers coming into Western Montana could drive their wagons in the, uh, amongst these trees because they're a parkland. They weren't um, had they weren't built up with a lot of fuels on the ground, and so that was a regular burning of the forest. I think you know most all of you know these days that forest that fires are essential for a proper ecosystem management and diversity, and so that the tribes were uh, using that quite regularly. Um, some of you may know of the Gerard Larch Grove in Sealy Lake, which is pretty interesting. I, I've taken students there before. And um, it's 1,000 years old. And uh, they studied the, the fire um, intervals. And it was every 24 years. And they said that wasn't a natural fire regime that had been propagated by uh, the, the local tribes, which would have been most likely the Pondere um, tribes in this area. Uh, yeah. So uh, with that, uh, there we go. So then here's um, two real prominent uh, culturally modified trees here. There's Tony Cashola there looking at one of the trees in the uh, Bitterroot. I think that might be false flat uh, culturally modified tree. And that's Francis Vandenberg there with a in the Bob Marshall, um, and uh, she's probably looking there, leaning up against that uh, that scarred tree there. Um, and so it was an annual practice every spring to scar trees and to extract the cambium layer out there. The cambium was eaten. Uh, it has nutrients, uh, sugars, minerals, vitamins in that. And um, it was a, 
a source of food in, in the spring. Some archaeologists, anthropologists would say, oh, that was a survival food. And when things got tough, they went to the trees. But no, that's what it, what it wasn't. Um, we have, uh, uh, I've read a report by Thane White, which is, he was a early archaeologist in the 40s and 50s on the Flathead Reservation. And he interviewed Baptist Matthias uh, Kootenai, uh, elder that knew about uh, the, the scarring of the trees and such. And he said that the women were the major scarring of these trees and extraction of the um, cambium. There's other, other scarred trees out there too, um, like cedar trees. They were used, the bark was extracted to make bark baskets and such for, for berry gathering and such. So there's other modified trees out there. There was even um, the white bark um, um, pine, not the, uh, um, the white pine tree. It was the, the bark was used for canoe building, and those those don't seem to last. I we don't I don't never observed a canoe strip tree um, bark, but um, and the only trees that we see usually these days is the ponderosa pines because the ponderosa pines live uh, five six hundred years old. So the other ones, elders talked about uh, the lodgepole. We extracted cambium from there, and they actually said that they liked the lodgepole taste better than the ponderosa pine. And I did have some students. I had them eaten uh, bark. I did a program uh, with Forest Service, and uh, next to my station, they were demonstrating the crosscut saw, and they had some fresh lodgepole there. And I went over there. I was, oh my gosh, this is some great. I said, you students, come on over. And I had them eaten the cambium then too of that. And it was sweet, but I mean, it's not sweet like a candy bar. And when it's fresh like that, it tastes a little turpentine-y, like, you know, pitchy. So uh, the best thing is, is to dry it out. And that was more the tradition with uh, my elders, too, ancestors with that. They would dry the thin strips. It was like an eighth of an inch, maybe thick, maybe even a little less than that, the, the strips of bark or the cambium. And um, they said the best thing to do is to let it dry. And they had grind it up, pound it up with their grindstones and then um, put it into a buckskin bag, and then they would be able to flavor their soups and meats and other foods with it. So they were using it as uh, fortifying, of course, their, their nutrient value of their foods, but also uh, changing the taste to it also. Um, yeah. So, um, I'm teaching my youth crew and other people about the, the culturally modified trees out on the landscape. Um, they're, they're, they're extensive. There's hundreds, maybe in the thousands. And I've had the great opportunity to probably map and document a majority of them in Western Montana. Um, and I run a youth crew for seven weeks uh, in the summer and they get paid to do this. They do, it, they, they do forest restoration work along with um, a career track exposure to professionals in the natural resource and the cultural resources fields. Um, and so then here uh, we're working with my youth crew, uh, their high school reservation youth, um, give them something to do during the summer, keep them out of trouble, <laughs> um, give them some pay, teach about the, the natural resource professions and also teach about their heritage and such. Um, and the, here we're, this is Ryan Powell, archeologist for the Flathead National Forest. And we're in the Tally Lake area where uh, some uh, culturally modified trees are around that lake there. And then we're at the Condon uh, Work Center where there's a series of culturally modified trees back there. And I'm teaching the students about those trees. And then up here is the Swan Massacre of uh, 1908 uh, in the Swan Valley there and talking about our tribes and their continued use, horse packing into the Bob Marshall and that area. That's uh, Holland Lake is, is not far from there. And uh, the Gordon Ranch is back, back on this other side of the highway is where the massacre happened and such. And I won't get into that about, about that quite yet. There's a lengthy story about that. Um, but, uh, but, to, but to talk about their heritage and some of the kids there some of their family was in that massacre right there. So they learn about their heritage, about the, about the, um, uh, the history of that valley. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. <clears throat> so I've got a situation here. 
not good. We've got a lot of these culturally modified trees that are in danger of being burnt up with fires. Because of fire suppression, not putting a, a regular uh, application of, of fire to the landscape, we're getting a lot of fuels building up around these trees. I'll get it here. And so here is a couple of trees that burned up by the fuels that were around closely built up around those trees and such. So um, we got an issue in the Bob Marshall wilderness where a lot of fuels are building up along, around these trees, around Murphy Flats, um, White River, Big Prairie, things like that. And, and I'm concerned about them. In the year 2003, a lot of a large fire event happened in the Bob Marshall and a considerable amount of these trees died and such. So um, I'm, I'm advocating for management of these trees in the wilderness area, which is a little bit, people are a little like, well, I don't know, you know, what are you gonna do? You gonna bring up chainsaws and stuff like that? And I said, no, I'm gonna bring my youth crew up there and we're gonna take hand saws and we're gonna clear around those trees and preserve them. I mean, if we can preserve the historic cabins back in there, we can grandfather in corrals and stuff like that for commercial packers. Why can't we manage these trees in the, in the wilderness area? So um, ideally, I could be taking uh, my youth crew up there every, every summer and we could be managing those trees back in there. But I've, I'm already, so here's, here we're, we're, we're assessing some trees, scarred trees there and there. Look at all the, um, the service berry and there's juniper built up around those trees. And those, if a fire came through, those trees would die. And they're living artifacts. They're some of the oldest, uh, one of the oldest trees that was dated around Flathead Lake was dated, it was, it was scarred in 1734. And so there's a, there's a, there's a legacy, there's, there's um, a history uh, to these. So um, how will you help? That's, uh, so uh, other people, uh, these, these studies here that I've, uh, Lars Osland, people may know that this study here, uh, they came over from Norway, I believe, or Sweden, and they said we have world-class stands of these culturally modified trees in the Bob Marshall, and that maybe we should start managing them in some ways. Uh, and then this is, this is the Thane White report right here from uh, 1954, uh, where Baptist Matthias had uh, included the inf cultural information on that. Um, okay, before I go any more questions and answers. <laughs> I just heard that. So some of you may know about some of these trees out there too. There are, a, yep, Flathead Lake, there's Glacier Park, has a lot of these trees too. So, um, I'll entertain questions or comments now. Yeah, Aaron. <laughs> yeah. We had really tall people then. No. <laughs> Is that how tall I am? <laughs> no. Um, uh, <clears throat> That we kind of thought that possibly was snow. They're standing on snow. It may be that early. It may have been, you know, early enough to, to harvest the, bay, the, the, but there was still snow on the ground. Yeah, we do find them pretty high sometimes. And I found a one, one um, as the elder says, uh, don't, don't take all the bark around the tree, you'll, you'll kill it. But I, I did observe a tree in the Bob Marshall on a large, one of the biggest old growth ones, it had four or five scars on it. And it had about eight inches of bark and it was still really healthy. So all those nutrients were still going through the cambium and keeping the tree alive. Good observation on that. <laughs> Michael back. Insight in the 
Yeah, uh, on on the, you mean from the past on up to present or so? Yeah, I I, uh, I think there has been some anthropological information on tribal numbers in those days. Today we have about 8,000 tribal members, Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderay people, uh, with probably about uh, more than 5,000, 6,000 of them are still on the reservation, others spread out from there. Um, if that answers your question. Historically, okay. So our, um, it is considered by most archeologists, the Salish, Ponderay, and the Kootenai are some of the longest lived uh, tribes in Montana. Where we have the, uh, I just wanted to get to something like that. Um, the Plains tribes are somewhat a little bit later. They have origins of Canada and Great Lakes area era, and they came into this area. So our Aboriginal homelands extended out into Eastern Montana. And then with the incursion of a lot of the Plains tribes, pushing us back into the interior of uh, the Rocky Mountain Range and such. Um, our Salish and dialect tribes, Ponderay and the Bitterroot Salish, they're both same, same dialect tribe, uh, same dialect, Salish dialect, which extends all the way west into northern Washington, uh, Canada, and up to British Columbia, and along the coast up in that area. So we're the farthest interior Salish tribe. Uh, so the Salish and tribes are, are are great, very numerous in that in that sense. I'm not sure if I've. Uh, yes, I, I believe there is, um, but I, I I'm sorry, I can't give you that number. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd have to look back look back at the at what some of the anthropologists have have estimated. Yes, Judy. Oh. I noticed that black from what from what I heard from the elders that um I think it was Pete Beaver had had said and he's he's of course long long ago um during some of those negotiations with the um Blackfeet tribes I think it was uh DeSmit or so was was trying to negotiate a peace with the Blackfeet and the Salish and the Salish said no, we're not going to stop going to the Sweetgrass Hills. We've, we've always historically hunted in that area, and we're going to continue with that. And then that's where that, where that, and so then conflict kept on going. So then they knew that if they're going to go out to hunt the bison on the Rocky Mountain front, there's going to be conflict. And so they, they readied themselves for that. Yeah, Phil. Tim, thank you for the talk. It's very fascinating. Uh, can you speak to the pictographs that are found in Iowa and Rocky Forest? Yeah, yeah, of, of the lake, yeah. Um, yeah, there's uh, from the, some of the archaeologists like Kaiser. Kaiser is a known individual on study of pictographs and petroglyphs uh, within Montana. And a lot of the, uh, in the end of the Rockies here, it is thought to be a more plateau style, Columbia River plateau style of pictographs. They're different than the co than, than um, the plains uh, uh, pictographs. Uh, the plains have a lot of the um, shield bearing warriors, which a lot of them were, were large shield that they st stood behind, and those shields like came up to their, their 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 neck and all the way down to the ground, and that that's kind of an indication of pre-horse even too to a certain degree. Um, because of course, when they had the horse, then their 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 shields became smaller. But um, uh, the a lot of there's there's pictographs on the reservation east of Missoula there too, uh, the, down the Bitterroot, and um, there's a fair amount of that they call finger marks or tally marks on there too, and uh, representing a number of days, animals, miles, or distances, things like that. We're not sure. So the interpretation they've said too could be very personal to an individual and their spiritual quest and their spiritual con con connection to whatever. Um, there's, I know that some pictograph panels 
had uh, a fair amount of offerings put before the panels and such too. Um, the one, there's one out by Bearmouth area that uh, in the, after the World War II, a military man went out and, and dug up all the artifacts. And I guess one, art, art, one archeologist said there was extraordinary items there that were not from the Montana area. So that was a pretty extensive movement of even other peoples coming through here and leaving their offerings there too. Yeah. But they're, they're kind of a mystery too. You know, to a certain degree, yep. And uh, it's it's pretty hard to age them too, yep. Unless there's an identifiable um, uh, symbol or something like that that they contribute to that. I know on the coast, some of the pictographs there was uh, uh, that that some of the tribes made there on the rocks was actual ship, a three-masted ship, and they thought that might be from Cook and his um, exploration in coming into the Puget Sound in that area. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, Baptist Matthias, in this report that I showed you earlier, and how he um, let's go back to a scarred tree. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Let's go back to this. Yeah. Okay. So, um, in the spring, when the plants start reacting to the change of temperature, light, and water. Uh, the, the uptake of nutrients and water through the cambium layer starts, and uh, and that cambium layer starts to swell. And when it swells, then it's easier to get the bark off. But before that, it, it's pretty hard to get the bark off of the off the tree. Um, I know that because we did we scarred some with uh, our elders group, and um, it was in the spring, and we tried it. At later dates, and it was almost impossible to get at that that cambium to get a nice pull of the bark off there. Um, the way Baptist Matthias had described it is that they would take a, a, a almost like like a bat, the length of a bat, and almost the thickness of a long branch of a hardwood like juniper, um, hawthorn, or something like that, and they would put it into the side of the tree, and they'd take a, a hammer stone and hammer it into the bark, and then pry a bit, go up a little bit, hammer it in the bark, and pry, and go up alongside of that scar. Um, I don't see it too well in this. I think it's just because of the photo. But we usually see these little divots where they had pounded that stake in there, or that chisel, and how, and how they kind of pried it. And um, kind of a funny thing is that most of them, of course, were on the right side because people with right-handed, right? We found about 15% of them was on the left side. <laughs> so what do you do with that information? You just say, well, 15% of the people who scarred that was left-handed. <laughs> I mean, sometimes archeological uh, data gathering is nothing but just data sometimes too. <laughs> but um, so, okay, so then after the bark was pulled back, then sometimes the cambium would be on that inner bark of the tree or it'd be on the bark. And so you either scrape it off the bark or, the, or, or on the trunk of the tree. And it would come up in strips. And uh, Baptist Matthias said uh, the elders used to use a big, big, big horn sheep horn and they would shape it just right and then shave it down a sharp edge where they could get it underneath the cambium. Then after that, he said, then we took coffee can lids <laughs> and, and used the coffee can lids to get underneath that and, and to help to pull off the, the, the strips of cambium. And, um, and so then the tree wouldn't die because we didn't, we didn't ring around the tree and stop that process of the nutrients moving up and up and through the tree and, and such. So, um, and then you see the cut marks on that inner piece of wood there and on both of them, and that's secondary use. People came afterwards and they camped underneath those trees and they said, wow, this looks like some good wood, pitchy wood. I can I'm gonna chop that off and start my fire with it. So that was, that was, that's what's going on there, is that secondary use there where they, they cut through there. Um, did I answer your question? Okay, great. Uh, Jim. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Um, I'm finding out. Um, I, I've talked to um, Ryan Powell, the archaeologist. I've, I've worked with Ryan for many years, too. He used to be down in the Dillon area, and we used to run a, a youth crew down there of Shoshone, Bannock, and um, Salish Kootenai high school kids, and we would do uh, career track work with them through the natural resources, and then we would take them around to the archaeological sites down there, and we, we, would, we would talk about uh, those areas. Um, now Ryan's up in the Flathead National Forest, and I've, I've presented that to him, and he says, well, okay, Tim, let's, let's think about it. Let me see what I can do. And so then he came back maybe about a month later on, and he says, well, I don't know about it. I said, I've already kind of floated it in front of some civic organization, groups of people, environmental uh, and, and otherwise, and he said they weren't very favorable to that, doing any management on those trees. Um, so what that means to me is that there just needs to be more education about them and such to identify their importance to not only the tribes, but just the, uh, the archaeological science, anthropological science in general, and that they're a part of the bob. They're the part of that what makes the bob is, is, is those cultural resources that are there and such. So, um, so uh, even this event right here, is part of the educational process. And so hopefully, yes, that we'll be able to get something going. One thing we wanted to do, um, Louis Adams, who is one of the other elder that we horse packed in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, his, her daughter, his daughter wants to get access to the, all the tapes and recordings of him that we did in the Bob Marshall. So we did that three years in a row that we took him in the Bob. And so then we want to make a movie of him and highlight the, the, the culturally modified trees. So that hopefully then that helps educate the public about the importance of those. Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, yeah, the, um, the month of, uh, of March is the month of geese. And, and when, the, when the, then that's the geese is coming back from the south. And so that, that's a, another cultural bioindicator of spring kind of coming. So uh, geese, yes. Um, the, oh, I, I was going to, a modern day, uh, I was talking about the eagles, and they're around my house. And when they disappear in the spring, I know they're out eating the afterbirth of the cattle being born. <laughs> Another cultural bioindicator. We don't need to go into. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that's a good question. Yeah. We. Uh, I should explore that a little bit more. Um, off the top of my head, I'm. I'm not too sure what else would be that. Yeah. But, but thank you for that question. Um, I'm curious, like, what percentage do you estimate of like trails out in the Bob or like any like local um, recreational trails or something that has like a boat? Like, what if, if the Bob, like, what percentage of that is like? Okay, yeah, um, I should go back to a map on that. What? Yeah, he was, um, you, you were referring to the major trails, right? Okay, um, the, uh, I know that, one of the most direct routes that our tribes used from the Flathead Valley to get to the bison was through um, the Jocko. Like if you take from the, from the reservation, going through the Jocko, then hitting the Blackfoot River um, uh, drainage, and then going directly out to, you know, getting out to almost Great Falls there. Sun River was a major uh, camping area for our tribes uh, to hunt the, the bison there. Um, and so that, so that was one route. The secondary route, because a lot of people were moving through the Blackfoot River corridor there. Secondary route was going um, directly over the Mission Mountains and uh, Eagle Pass, Mormon Pass, uh, Piper Crow, uh, North Crow, Piper Crow area across the missions. And then um, another major trail would have been through uh, Holland Lake area and then Big Salmon, Big Salmon, White River, 
White River on out Benchmark and on the Rocky Mountain front. So that was a real major trail route there. Now it is so busy, I almost don't want to go that way because <laughs> that gets a lot of traffic, that, that route. Um, I wanted to get to one of the trail maps here. Doesn't seem to be responding too well. Um, but um, yeah, Mariah's, okay, so some of the major routes, Mariah's Pass was one of the north ones, and that was, didn't go through uh, Bad, Can Bad Rock Canyon. That went over to Enos Pass, which is the um, a series of lakes back up in there. But it was Enos Pass that came down in, into the South Fork of the, um, into the South Fork where the Hungry Horse Reservoir is, Quintonkin Creek, then over into the Bear, uh, eventually in the southern part of the Glacier Park, Bear Creek, and then, then out that way. Uh, that was the major route there. That, yeah, as, you, as you know, Bad Rock, as you go through there, the river's so close in there that you know you might be able to get through there in the summertime, but other times would be, high water would be pretty hard. So that's the most northern route. And then, um, and then you got the Blackfoot River, Kent River there. And then if you go down farther from like Bonner and that, that, that gets you out the Blackfoot. Then you got the Little Blackfoot River going out Helena. And then, and then you've got, uh, eventually you're, you're going Butte, Anaconda, and then you're coming out uh, eventually on the Yellowstone River, uh, that area too. So those are kind of major arterial routes that way. And then secondary routes there that, that came about through that too. There's numerous of those, numerous trails with that. So did, did that answer your question? Okay. We'll just leave it there. Okay.